Welcome back to A People's Guide to Publishing, the podcast. Coronavirus edition. I am your host, Joe Beale, the autistic publisher, author of A People's Guide to Publishing, the book. Now in this newer, glossier reprint, and founder and CEO of Microcosm. And I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the editorial and marketing director of Microcosm. If you've been getting our email newsletters, um, that's from me. Hi, nice to see you, kind of. This week, we are practicing extreme social distancing. My doctor said that I was doing better at it than anyone else that she'd talked to, in that I have been within six feet of only three people within the past week. So, uh, Joe and I live together, which is why we're sitting so close together. Oh, this is one of them. Spoiler alert. <laughs> it's YOLO. Joe, and the dog is another one. Dog is not a person. The dog is six feet away right now, much to her chagrin. She's kind of bummed about it. She's not. Fifteen months ago, we expanded our office. After we had had some considerable growth, we added some more office space, some more warehouse space, some more space space. And yet, you know, we've always offered the opportunity to work from home. And so a lot of people take us up on that, particularly, you know, when they're just not feeling it or, you know, when that would be a more productive way to work. And... You know, publishing is social isolation work, generally speaking. It's very introverted. And so, all that considered, this really isn't any different from our norm. So we have um, made our normal introverted social isolationness more... um, Mandated. More mandated, you know. And we also are doing a lot more disinfecting of surfaces. Fewer Mm -hmm. people are coming in than before. Skeleton crew. Very skeleton crew. Today it's just him and me. Of which I am the... Anyway, yes. The burlier skeleton. <laughs> skeleton with a with a ready for the famine. Mm-hmm. Prepared. And, and we, we also changed the way that our delivery people interact with us. Yeah. They no longer enter the building. They now enter through the back gate, walk away with the boxes, never to be touched by us again. What about um, customers? What customers? That's a good question. So, like, I would say two weeks ago, we stopped having customers in the store. Maybe one person would come in every three days, and then finally we just locked the door. We were like, order online, pick it up. And it was kind of weird that recently that people wanted to come in. I mean, I get it on a social isolation level that people want to come in, and books are your best friend and all that. But on a totally different level, it perplexed me a bit that people would want to risk exposure Because often what would happen is we would let a delivery person in and then a pack of customers would stealthily creep in behind them. And then we would have to be like, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And they would be like, what? And you got to wonder if some people just live so deep in books that they don't have the news. So now we use technology instead. We have a doorbell. Mm -hmm. Very high tech. You might hear it on this podcast. If you're lucky. But... You know, the interesting thing to all this is having watched the publishing industry freak out. Harkening back to the days where HarperCollins instituted... I love to pick on HarperCollins. They're sort of the, like, ugly stepchild of the literary industrial complex. And so they instituted and really patted themselves on the back when they launched direct-to-consumer ordering in 2007. 2007, mind you, being pretty late in the game for that stuff. Like, you know, we were 10 years ahead of them on that. And, you know, Amazon was 12 years ahead of them on that. And that was who they were really trying to compete with, you know, much in the same way that Barnes & Noble tried to compete with Amazon with the Nook and also failed abysmally because it was just too little, too late, not enough features, you know, etc., etc. But... So this is sort of the thing that we've always done well is being nimble. And so we wanted to share with you some advice about how to adapt to changing situations. If you're a publisher, an author, or a bookseller. Yeah, we, I'm running the situation room where I'm like, okay, well, if this doesn't pencil out, then like I have this plan, and then I have you know plans A through Z, Z, basically. And so... <laughs> You know, it's basically like, I don't get boxed in for this reason. And so, you know, we had a shout out to Charlie Jane Anders, who... Thanks, Charlie Jane! 
threw us a little bit of a tweet and a little bit of a Facebook post on Sunday that resulted in quite a few mail orders for us. But, you know, it's more than that. It's not just leaning and relying on other people because I feel like that's sort of exactly what got publishers into this mess. You know, it was relying on bookstores to do all of their marketing for the past 200 years and then now trying to rely on Amazon to do that and then being, you know, incredibly guffawed when Amazon is like, that costs money now (laughs) when the bookstores were doing it for free out of their love of books. And, you know, we, not that we're the greatest at marketing, but we're certainly forward thinking compared to our stagnant industry. I take that as a challenge. Mm-hmm. Soon and we'll be the greatest. <laughs> give it time. Give it time. Marketing director. And and so part of it, too, is, you know, you have to always think of, you know, and marketing is showing somebody a book and explaining to them enough information and about it to show them why they care. Like, this book is a great coaster for your drink, especially if you're recording audio. But also, you know, it's called Five Modes of Leadership. And it's, I feel like it's a really well-developed book. It's telling you who it's for, who it's not for, what it is, what you're getting out of it, and what is different about it from other books about leadership. But it also, like, um, harks back to other business books, like The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It tells you there's going to be a plan, and you can read it on the airplane, basically. And people love numbers. They love numberology to be, like, three ways to make things more badass. So the coronavirus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's book development that the industry got so far away from that they rely upon outside forces for marketing. And if I may pick on the industry a little bit more, I'd say one of the biggest problems is authors, publishers, booksellers have still only figured out three ways to market fiction, and they have not yet figured out the fourth way. Mind you, the three ways are to utterly and completely saturate the industry with advanced reader copies in a desperate attempt to generate buzz, to send an author out on an expensive and complicated book tour, and by partnering this fiction with a previously successful fiction in an attempt to create a new fiction that doing the same thing over and over again is going to be functional. On the fourth way that they have. There isn't a fourth way. They have only found three ways. They have not yet to... In- I mean, when the fourth way is invented, man, they're going to go gangbusters on that one. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of reader-oriented <laughs> fiction development, is my prediction. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Not to foreshadow that fourth mm-hmm. way. But so that's exactly it. It's, it's the same problem for hundreds of years that was fine... You know, even in the 1990s, that was fine because there just wasn't anywhere near the volume that there is now. Where, and this is the broken record period of the podcast that we have every week. <laughs> but when you have 8,000 new books published every day, you cannot rely on the same three types of marketing over and over again. You really have to say, why does anybody care? Who cares? How do I talk to those people that cares? Oh, one of the main things that we're doing right now is A, catching up on our inboxes because we haven't really had a chance to catch up on our projects for a while. But B, we're really focusing on planning for the future because that's when this is really going to hit us. Publishing, you're always living in the future. Like That's when the bills are due. That's when the money comes in. That's when this economic uh, turmoil is really going to hit us. So we're focusing on our strategy, on really honing in our book development, our marketing plans, how we talk to people about what we've always been doing and what we're going to continue doing and how we connect with our readers. We haven't laid off anybody, you know, so our our staff is still fully staffed working their normal hours that they did a month ago. And, you know, so obviously that will create the same financial demands that most other weeks, months, years do. And so we're dealing with that by most of our purchasing is now for our published work. So our distribution catalog has no longer needed to do any purchasing, which, you know, saves us five figures a month. 
but definitely is contributing to the woes of other publishers. Yeah, and that is only making those other publishers more desperate to sell things to us that are further and further away from the kind of things we purchase. Again, poor marketing. See previous statements. And then it's dialing it back to saying, okay, when we go direct to consumer, that's always been our bread and butter. That's always been what we've good at, you know, and that is because you get the much better margin you know you're taking home the biggest piece of the pie and that is the best way to pay for your staff because then you know the author makes more money but at this time much more importantly sorry authors we can pay our staff because the real trouble of this moment in time is when every business lays off their entire staff it's not just those people, it's all the places that those people spent money. Your short-term solution here is also a long-term solution, which is to reach out directly to readers. And the best way to do that is to first of all calm yourself, meditate, go for a walk, whatever you have to do so that you are not feeling desperation when you do this. Because if you do, that'll kill it. And really reach back into your history and also think forward into your future and like tell your story tell the story of your books, talk about why it matters to you, talk about why it matters to your authors, why it talks, talk about why it matters to other people, talk about why your work is important to the world and what impact that it has. And you can do this on social media. It's a great idea to start an email newsletter. Please have it be opt-in only. Don't just add people to it. Um, it's not a sustainable way to grow it, believe me. Um, you can do this on a blog. You can create bundles of different books on your website. And also like reach out to other people that are doing similar work to you and see if you can work together. It's a great time to buddy up. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, it's understandable that you're probably panicking right now. Because it is, you know, nothing is scarier than an uncertain future and an uncertain period of time until that future happens. So I found that the best thing to do is to become organized. So mm -hmm. if you can map out all of your expenses that you've already committed to and put those on your, your accounting timeline, you know, when you would have to pay them. And then look at all of the income that you already have committed to you and when you would receive that. And then work backwards and see when you will need more money, see how much money you'll need, and then look at it from the other perspective of, okay, how much money do I need to earn per day in order to remain solvent through this? Like, what, where can I cut my budget? And don't just lay off your staff. Don't do it. Like, run a Kickstarter project if you need to. Take out, even take out a loan if you need to. I mean, interest rates are really good right now. The thing that people fail to consider is that training new people are often is a far more expensive thing to do. Than yeah. to like have your people working on borrowed money for the next month. And, you know, to lose that goodwill. Yeah. It's true. Well, this has been a People's Guide to Publishing podcast. Coronavirus I'm edition. And I'm your host, Joe Beal, author of A People's Guide to Publishing, founder and CEO of Microcosm. I'm Ellie Blue. Uh, I do some marketing work around here. Until next week. Thanks for joining us once again. Please send your questions to podcast at microcosmpublishing.com so we can answer them on future episodes. And please give us five stars on iTunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed. You can find us on the internet at microcosm.pub. On Twitter at microcosm. On Facebook at microcosm publishing on Instagram at microcosm underscore pub. And here in Portland, Oregon on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.